Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us at this very important session. Welcome to the World Economic Forum, CNBC debate, the future of the Eurozone. How will the Eurozone economies emerge from the current crisis? Before we begin and I introduce our special panelists this morning, let's take a listen on how this has played out on CNBC. Look at this. Yes. We are going to be showing you some clips right now of some business leaders and heads of state who have discussed the happenings in Europe over the last six months and the preceding two years. We want to get their take on what has occurred in the preceding two years and where are we today. After you hear from these distinguished people having spoken about the events in the Eurozone, we will hear from our distinguished panel on where we are today. Once again, take a listen. have just come outside of Parliament and formed a police line. They have no doubt whatsoever about the strength of the Euro, about its permanence, about its irreversibility. We need to take decisive action to help stabilize the Eurozone. Greece's future is within the Eurozone. $146 billion for a nation, which is only 2.5% of the Eurozone GDP. And they think that if Greece goes, other bigger nations could go. If there were a failure to resolve that situation, it would pose threats to the European financial system, to the global financial system. The authorities will do the, whatever it takes to hold the system together. The alternative is just too terrible to contemplate. The biggest headwind the American economy is facing right now is uncertainty about Europe. I have decided on my own counsel to step down as the leader of the Unified. Breaking news, the Portuguese Prime Minister Socrates has resigned. finally expecting to get the announcement on the new Italian Greek government. At the moment from the Italian Prime Minister Silva Berlusconi that will step just down. just heard that the ruling Spanish party has just lost the election. It's often discussed that uh, leaving the Euro is uh, an option for Greece. Uh, I think this is really not an option. What I think is needed is to extract more in terms of overall productivity and competitiveness of Europe by finally creating a really, a deeply single market. We must all draw the lessons uh, from the ongoing crisis uh, and uh, help to solve it. Uh, and this goes for the financial sector as well. The ECB is the only really functioning European institution, whether they like it or not. Gaining credibility is a long and laborious process. Maintaining is a permanent challenge. But losing credibility can happen very, very quickly. And joining me right now on stage to discuss the developments and where we are right now, all the way to my left, Wolfgang Schäuble, German Finance Minister, Minister Francois Baron, French Finance Minister, Louise de Guindos, Spanish Economy Minister, and Oli Ren, European Monetary Affairs Commissioner. Gentlemen, thank you very much for your time and for speaking to us today. We just heard Mario Draghi say that confidence is the most critical part here. Minister Baron has the most recent facility by the ECB instilled stability and confidence in terms of where we are right now. Uh, hello to everybody. Uh, Mario Draghi has uh, a decision. Mario Draghi took a decision with the uh, Governing Council of the ECB, which was a very important decision. Uh, 
In the framework of the agreement of the 9th of December, there was a debate between France and Germany, as you know, within the Eurozone about the status of the European Central Bank and about its qualification as lender of last resort. Now, some of us in the world in general and uh, within the European Union consider that uh, it was a, a reasonable debate. Now, uh, the debate no longer exists because uh, the case law in Strasbourg, the case law in Europe, Monti, Merkel and Sarkozy have decided that uh, the ECB will no longer be at the center of the debate. The ECB is considered independent, it has its own policy, and uh, we can certainly say whether we think that this or that decision is right. But um, the the, uh, the uh, unlimited amount of liquidity for banks for three years at 1% has considerably reduced the tensions uh, in the European banking industry and it's very important because it will uh, enable us uh, to restore confidence gradually but it's not enough of course there will have to be more tranches we'll have to confirm the agreement of the uh, 9th uh, December um, on the two issues uh, of uh, the agreement between the heads of state of government in the 9th of December a, a fiscal issue um, uh, the treaty uh, ratification of the treaty and a solidarity issue and uh, thought about uh, how we can together um, continue to support growth. Minister Schorble, how do you see it? In German and France uh, see it basically in a very same way. The cause of the crisis is basically the fact uh, that uh, there has been a lack of uh, fiscal discipline in a number of countries in the Eurozone and uh, a lack of competitiveness uh, of a number of countries. If we want to overcome the crisis, if we want to restore the confidence which has been lost, as Mario Draghi has just said in this clip, then what we have to do is, first of all, to fight against the causes of the crisis. In other words, uh, that's something that has to be done in the relevant countries. And that is happening, and where it's happening, uh, the uh, developments on the markets uh, are positive. Uh, that's the case in Italy, that's the case in Spain. Uh, we're seeing that uh, confidence is gradually being restored. Second thing is that uh, we need uh, a better structure for the European currency. This is, what, this is what we're doing with the fiscal compact and with the European stability mechanism and uh, the agreement uh, has been reached uh, by finance ministers uh, this week and it will be put before the heads of state and government on Monday and we hope that we can sign it in February and uh, we shall be able to bring it into force very soon. And we hope that uh, we can quickly uh, pay in capital to it. And the fiscal compact will do something which we haven't had enough of so far, which is institutions and rules, which make it possible for us uh, to uh, agree on a common fiscal policy in Europe. And then, of course, we must also strengthen the competitiveness of European countries. And that is uh, the uh, task that uh, the European Council will have on its agenda next Monday. And of course, these things uh, don't happen overnight. And uh, while these things are happening, we need solidarity. This is the solidarity mechanism. This is something uh, which uh, the ECB is doing in its independence, uh, of course, but it's uh, doing what is necessary. And we, have, we must make sure that we don't set the wrong signals, the wrong incentives. Uh, we mustn't uh, prevent things uh, that must happen from happening first. And, uh, but if we all act together, Together, then we're on the right track and we shall do everything we need to do and uh, the Europe and uh, the European Union uh, will have a stable currency and if uh, we have we'll be able to uh, deal with uh, the debt problems in other parts of the world which are bigger than they are in the eurozone we will get back to the comment you made uh, we must prevent things from happening because I think that we all would like to know uh, specifically uh, more, more on that comment, but, but Minister Guindos, uh, from your standpoint, uh, how do you achieve what Minister Schreble is saying in terms of solidarity, uh, solidarity rather, and unity? 
Well, I am in broad agreement with what uh, Francois and Wolfgang uh, have said uh, about uh, you know, liquidity. Liquidity is not the final cure uh, to the problems that we have right now in the Eurozone. It's a helping hand, but not a final cure. But I think that I fully agree also that uh, what we have to do is to, first of all, to put our houses in order, to advance uh, in fiscal consolidation, uh, to avoid uh, uh, and to circumvent the problems that we made in the past in terms of uh, you know, public deficit and excessive level of debt. And simultaneously, uh, and I think that this is going to be uh, in the agenda over the next uh, months and weeks, to try to take the measures to foster growth. And I think that uh, you know, we, are, we are going to, to speak more and more about growth and employment. And I think that uh, you know, that will be you know, the agenda of uh, the next uh, weeks. We are very close uh, to have a new institutional framework that I think that will be extremely useful to avoid uh, the mistakes and the flaws that we had in the past. And simultaneously, I think that uh, we have to bring to the fore the agenda of growth, of reforms, of employment. Isn't this the crux, though, of the problem in terms of moving forward? Oli Ren, how do you achieve growth in a moment of time when you actually are implementing austerity? That is indeed uh, the key question for, for Europe uh, at this uh, juncture. And uh, in order to create uh, foundations for uh, sustainable growth and uh, job creation, we first have to resolve uh, the sovereign debt crisis uh, and uh, mitigate uh, the banking sector fragilities. Uh, why so? Because this is essentially a crisis of uh, confidence uh, and uh, in order to resolve uh, this uh, crisis of confidence uh, we have to do things like uh, the European Central Bank has been doing. I find uh, the ECB actions uh, very important uh, in terms of uh, avoiding a credit crunch uh, in the European economy and also facilitating uh, some uh, more favorable bond auctions of, uh, say, Italy, Spain, and uh, also the return of uh, Ireland uh, to the bond market uh, in uh, the last couple of uh, days. So the ECB actions are important, uh, but of course uh, not enough uh, alone, and uh, therefore we need to have uh, a focus on uh, basically three things. Uh, we need uh, a new fiscal compact, uh, and uh, we are in fact uh, revamping the institutional architecture of Europe uh, so that uh, we are soon going to have uh, an economic and monetary union mark II. It is going to be a very different uh, structure than, uh, than uh, the previous one and in the new structure prevention is the name of the game and uh, we want to prevent uh, the kind of uh, fiscal crisis uh, or external imbalances uh, that have happened uh, in the past years uh, with uh, terrible costs, uh, economic and uh, human costs. Second, uh, we need uh, stronger European financial firewalls uh, and uh, we are working this out uh, in these weeks uh, and I expect that uh, we can come to a positive conclusion where we also need uh, support from our American and uh, British friends uh, in a sense that uh, we need to increase uh, the resources of the International Monetary Fund. Uh, and uh, third, uh, yes, we need uh, a focus on uh, reforms uh, and uh, growth uh, employment, uh, as uh, Louis and his colleagues were saying. And in this regard, uh, I would draw your attention to the fact that uh, we have, in fact, uh, a wave of reforms uh, going on in Europe. Italy is moving fast uh, in its uh, structural reforms. Uh, Spain is moving and uh, in fact uh, all the European Union member states uh, are doing their part uh, both uh, in fiscal consolidation and uh, in terms of uh, structural reforms. So we have uh, a somewhat better sentiment for the moment. Uh, now it is uh, not the time for the Cassandras. Uh, it is the time to further build uh, confidence uh, and uh, that's why the coming days are so important, uh, because uh, we are going to finalize uh, some important uh, decisions uh, that will facilitate uh, better confidence into the European economy, so that uh, we can release and liberate uh, the Keynesian animal spirits uh, for growth, uh, investment uh, and uh, employment. 
and uh, who does not believe in the animal spirits uh, does not believe in the market uh, economy. Ali, you said some very important uh, themes there, and I would like all of your commentary on this. Uh, what, le let me first take on the firewalls. How much bigger and deeper firewalls would you like to see? What are we talking about? What's your expectation? Well, we have already decided that uh, the new permanent uh, European stability mechanism will have uh, a capital base of uh, 700 billion euros uh, which will provide uh, a, an effective lending capacity of uh, 500 billion euros. Now we have in operation a temporary European financial stability facility, which has uh, consumed uh, some uh, around 100 something, and with the new Greek program we'll have uh, something above 200 billion euros probably, which leaves uh, around uh, 250 billion euros uh, in this temporary EFSF. Uh, the question will be whether we can combine these uh, to the ESM and uh, the FSF. Uh, that's something that uh, the ministers and uh, the leaders of the Eurozone will have to discuss uh, and decide uh, in the coming weeks. In parallel with uh, the IMF, uh, where Christine Lagarde uh, has made uh, a request uh, for an increase of uh, 500 billion euros, the Eurozone has uh, committed already 150 billion euros. So, you can calculate uh, in which ballpark, uh, in which uh, range of uh, hundreds of billions uh, we are talking about uh, when we talk about uh, reinforced uh, financial firewalls uh, for the sake of uh, safeguarding financial stability in Europe. Minister Schäuble, Chancellor Merkel has made some bold statements about the long term and what needs to be done over the long term. But as we sit here today, the short term seems quite critical as we await a decision between Greece and its creditors. What is the plan over the short term? <laughs> First remark is uh, you never must do the opposite in the short term. You have to do it in the long term. Because if you want to regain credibility, you have to do the same in the same direction, in the short term and the long term. That is one of the critical issues. And therefore, uh, uh, we are working on fighting the, uh, the reasons of the crisis and uh, we will uh, uh, we have uh, to what is needed and we will decide what will be needed uh, to, to, to buy the necessary time we need uh, to. In the short term we are negotiating with Greece. Greece is a very specific case. You can't uh, 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 take any, uh, any consequence for any other member states in the euro, it's totally different. It's a very specific case in Greece. We need a reduction of the deaths and that it has been approved that uh, the Greece uh, uh, has to be reduced by the private sectors in 50 percent. And uh, we, we are negotiating the final negotiations and we were very clear on Monday in the Eurogroup that it, uh, uh, we need for a new program for Greece a death sustainability, and that means uh, the overall death in Greece not over 120 percent GDP in 2020. That has to be achieved. It's not easy, but it's possible and it will be done in the coming days. I'm quite, quite optimistic. Then we need a new program in Greece. And Greece has, and that is maybe the most critical issue, and we discussed it very clear on Monday, and on Mario Draghi, the ECB was very clear, IMF was very clear. Greece has not only uh, to commit itself, Greece has to deliver because Greece has committed itself two years ago and not all of the commitments has been delivered and fulfilled. And that is one of the critical issues to regain confidence and that was has to be done in Greece and uh, we must not give uh, the wrong incentives. No firewall. You can make any firewall, any, any figure. It will not work if the real problems will not be solved. I would like to get all of your takes on something that uh, has been talked about very much in the market, and that is, of course, a default in Greece. What is the worst case scenario? Many people expect Greece to default. What's the worst case scenario, Minister Schäuble? We don't expect to default in Greece. I know that uh, most uh, uh, participants in markets have, lengths, uh, have for a long time uh, in prices, 
But I don't expect the default increase. I am, I am, I am sure that if everyone is ready to deliver what has been agreed, and all the partners of Greece are ready to do it, we, we will avoid, we can avoid and we will avoid a default of Greece. But of course, the private sector has to take its responsibility. That has been agreed the first time in July, in the summit of July last year. It's not a new story. Uh, and now we are uh, discussing the, the concrete figures. And I am quite optimistic we can avoid it. But it depends on that Greece is ready to deliver and to fulfill its commitment. Minister Bauer. <laughs> Let me say, first of all, with the greatest respect I have uh, for uh, uh, my colleagues, we're not here in a negotiating session of the Eurogroup because uh, the, uh, the question that you raised about the firewall is an essential question in our discussions with Wolfgang and other uh, colleagues, uh, ministers of finance. We consider, and France defends this position, that uh, the higher the firewall, uh, the uh, less it will have to be used. I mean, that's the uh, deterrent effect. The the lesson, or one of the lessons we can draw from the crisis is that we have to deal with the Greek case, avoid contagion, put in place uh, the arrangements necessary for fiscal consolidation, for um, fiscal uh, economic and convergence, so that discipline means something. There have to be sanctions. Uh, we've uh, found uh, the balance uh, in uh, our discussions with Wolfgang and in other colleagues about the level of structural deficit, about the level of reference for the growth and stability pact. We still have a slight debate on uh, the, the, the reference, uh, the benchmark for the debt. That's a part of our discussions, and we must advance at the same pace with the the same intensity uh, on the issue of solidarity. And the issue of solidarity has already taken form. We're anticipating the permanent protection mechanism. We're bringing it forward by almost six months. And if we can bring it forward even faster, we shall do it. But we brought it forward already by six months. And what we have to do is to uh, accompany the idea that uh, the firewall is probably one of the best responses. But that's one of the issues. Uh, I must say that we haven't uh, dealt with this finally today, but it will be on the agenda of our leaders on Monday. Well, I, uh, I also think that uh, you know, it's very simple to try to focalize uh, the, the future of uh, the Eurozone on the problems of Greece with its creators, but I think that this is an oversimplification. I think that much more important than that uh, is uh, uh, you know, the actions that I, I think that we are taking in order to improve the institutional framework of the Eurozone in the future, to avoid the mistakes that we, we made in the past, and to have uh, you know, a much more uh, you know, uh, united uh, uh, common currency area. And uh, in that regard, uh, you know, I think that, for instance, the discussion that we are having about the fiscal compact, the, even the willing uh, and, the, and the purpose of the different governments to deliver, I think that is going to be the key element. It's going to be the key element in that regard. You know, for sure that we are going to need uh, firewalls, backstops, with uh, ample uh, liquidity, with, uh, you know, uh, uh, with uh, a lot of resources. But uh, I think that uh, at the end of the day, the vital element to restore confidence on the future of the Eurozone is going to be, you know, the institutional framework that we are going to put in place and simultaneously the degree of commitment of the domestic governments with the institutional framework and with the rest of the partners of the Eurozone. And in that regard, you know, the perception, I am the younger in arriving to office, you know, in this uh, club. But, uh, you know, the perception that I have uh, and the perception that I have, I have obtained is that there is a, uh, you know, growing consensus that, uh, you know, this is the way forward. Uh, we have a problem with Greece. We have a problem with other countries of the past. But we have, uh, you know, a concrete, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, consensus that uh, in the future we are going to try to avoid and we will we we'll act preemptively to avoid the problems that we had in the past. But let me follow up and ask the same question that uh, Minister Sherblay answered a moment ago. The long-term plan is in place. Everyone agrees on the long-term objectives. But what about the short term? But I think that, uh, you know, the difference between the long term and the short term, as uh, uh, Wolfgang has said, 
is uh, you know is uh, is a little bit uh, you know more confusing than uh, many think. If we start to create a credible plan that creates confidence in the short term, I think that uh, we are putting you know the first steps in order to to alleviate the shorter pressure that we are suffering right now. Uh, again, uh, you know, it's very easy to think and to, to, to elaborate on the Greek situation, but I think that it's much more important, even in the short term, to have a credible plan in terms of fiscal uh, union, in terms of corporate governance, in terms of commitment from the different members, member countries with, the, with, this, uh, with this new situation. I think that that would alleviate, that would mitigate many of the jittery that we are seeing right now in the markets. So how big of a firewall would you like to see? Well, I, I would not say any figure. I think that, uh, you know, the firewall has to be, uh, you know, big enough and flexible enough to avoid using it. And in order to avoid using this firewall, I think that, uh, you know, the main element that we have to take into consideration, the main element that we have to take in place is a new uh, fiscal framework, a new corporate uh, governance uh, framework, and simultaneously, you know, the commitment, the clear commitment of the different governments with, uh, you know, fiscal austerity and with uh, structural reform. I think that if we have these three pillars in place, you know, firewalls are there not to be used, to be a sort of deterrence. Only well, Ren, I'd, I'd like to get your comments on all of this, but from what you've heard so far, will this be enough to calm the markets and stop any dislocation, which of course would accelerate the problem? I have a uh, long time ago stopped uh, predicting the behavior of the markets uh, on the basis of uh, policy decisions. Uh, but uh, having said this, uh, I think uh, for the market forces uh, who are present uh, in this uh, audience, uh, I think there is uh, one, I mean there are many, but uh, one very important uh, observation you can make. There is in fact uh, quite strong unity among the ministers of the Eurozone and uh, the European institutions as well as regards uh, how we need to tackle this uh, crisis. And uh, in fact, uh, while I know more or less uh, how the Eurozone will look like, uh, say, in three years, uh, I must say that uh, the next uh, three days uh, will be very crucial for that uh, future of uh, in, uh, in three years. In other words, uh, we are just about uh, to close uh, a deal on uh, private sector involvement uh, between the Greek government uh, and uh, the private uh, creditor community. If not uh, today, maybe over the weekend, uh, but uh, in any case, uh, preferably still in January, rather than in February. We are very close and uh, we have to have uh, a sustainable solution for Greece, uh, even if, uh, as uh, Wolfgang said, uh, Greece is uh, a special and uh, unique uh, case uh, and uh, private sector involvement uh, in that sense will not be applied uh, to any other country of the Eurozone. And then we have two very important uh, decisions uh, related to this uh, basic uh, fair deal between uh, reinforced uh, fiscal discipline on the one hand uh, and uh, reinforced uh, financial firewalls uh, on the other hand. The treaty on a new fiscal compact uh, will be finalized uh, on Monday, which will help uh, create uh, a much uh, sturdier framework uh, of uh, the Eurozone economic governance. And uh, then in parallel, uh, the treaty on a European stability mechanism will be concluded. This will be a very important uh, three-day period uh, for reinforcing confidence uh, into the Eurozone and uh, I'm sure that uh, we will succeed uh, in these decisions uh, and uh, I hope of course that uh, it will have a positive confidence building impact uh, on the market sentiment. Let's talk about some of the ideas out there. Minister Scherble, talk to us about the possibility of a Eurobond. Do we need a Eurobond? Mario Monti backed the idea before becoming Prime Minister. Who pays and what are the terms? The problem of uh, Eurobonds is uh, as long as you don't have a structure in the European institutions, in the European treaties, to uh, have a similar structure for the fiscal policy, you have for the, we have for the, common, for the monetary policy, because the 
very specific uh, situation in the European currency is we have a European common monetary policy. No member state has sovereignty on in, in, in monetary policy. That is very specific. It's uh, difficult to understand if you are abroad from Europe. But in Europe, you, we gave up parts of national sovereignty to the European institutions. In the monetary policies, a, a European uh, monetary policy. We have a national fiscal policy. And that makes the problem. As long as we have not something like we are now doing, a fiscal union, to have a similar construction for fiscal discipline, as long common bonds gave the wrong incentives because you may uh, you you uh, you you spend money you don't have on the bill of, of, of others and that is uh, a wrong incentive in 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 a functioning uh, 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 market economy uh, at the end you have to pay your bills if you spend on the on, on the risk of others uh, it's a temptation everyone will fail in avoiding such a temptation uh, and therefore uh, we have to concentrate on building the, 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 the structure for, uh, for fiscal and, and even for a better competitiveness in the fiscal union. We, we, we knew when we, when we created the European currency, we knew that we will build, we have to build in the, in the coming years in, uh, and something like a political union. It's a, it's a, the European integration is always, has always been a method going step by step. If you want to start with 100%, you would never have achieved one step in European interest. If you, if you go step by step, what we did since the early 50s, we, were, uh, we, were, we have been, uh, in, in the long run, we have been tremendously successful. And we will, we will be in the future successful. I'm quite convinced. I'm, I'm convinced that it is on the long term the better way of building something like international or global governance in going step by step in building such structures and not uh, the other ways. But as long as we have, we must not give the wrong incentives and therefore uh, that, would be, that would be sent the wrong, the wrong message in fighting the real causes of the given crisis. Oli Ren. I would uh, tend to agree with uh, Wolfgang and uh, in my view, in fact, uh, for any serious move concerning uh, some kind of uh, Eurobonds uh, the necessary condition is uh, a substantial reinforcement uh, of uh, economic governance uh, of the European Union to create uh, an ever closer economic uh, or stability union. And in fact, uh, I want to give you one example of how this works uh, because it is uh, already moving forward. Uh, we talk about uh, the new fiscal compact uh, next uh, Monday. That's important uh, as a very profound uh, political commitment uh, of the national parliaments. Uh, but at the same time, we have already existing secondary legislation which entered into force mid-December. And because of that, I sent, five, I sent early warning letters to five member states, Belgium, Cyprus, Malta, Hungary and Poland, around mid-November, indicating that their fiscal targets in 2012 uh, are likely to be missed uh, unless uh, they take uh, additional measures. Uh, and if they do, do not take additional measures, uh, then uh, we may have to resort uh, to financial sanctions, uh, i.e. fines for the Eurozone countries. What happened, uh, four out of these uh, five countries uh, took action. Cyprus, uh, twice just before Christmas, uh, very difficult discussions in the parliament, uh, cutting its deficit from uh, above 5% uh, to around 2.5%. Uh, uh, Belgium, after difficult discussions uh, in the coalition government, uh, coming down from 4.5% uh, to 2.7%, 2 2.8% of uh, fiscal deficit. Uh, you see that uh, this six-pack, as we call this new legislation, the six-pack uh, is already working and uh, delivering and we will further enforce this uh, once we get uh, the new treaty on fiscal compact uh, in force. One final comment on this. Uh, I find uh, the German Council of uh, Economic Advisers uh, proposal on uh, a debt redemption pact uh, or debt redemption fund uh, 
as uh, very smart uh, and uh, potentially doable, which uh, is certainly worth exploring further. It has some resemblance uh, to the American audience, uh, some resemblance uh, to the events in the United States of America around uh, 1790, when uh, the first uh, Treasury Secretary of the US, uh, Alexander Hamilton, pushed through the assumption of the state debt uh, following the Revolutionary War and created uh, what we could call Eurobonds uh, in the United States of America, which, by the way, became the foundation of the federal economic uh, government uh, for the United States of America. And uh, the success of, the, of this uh, in the past uh, 212 years uh, should not be underestimated also on this side of the Atlantic. Thank you, Oli. I want you to jump in, Minister no, very, Guidos very, very, and, and Baron as well. I think that uh, Eurobonds uh, perhaps are uh, the final target, but I think that, as Wolfgang has mentioned, that we have to take a lot of steps before and that we are doing that. But I would like to, to, to stress, and I think that this is important, you know, the, the importance of the political commitment of the different member states. I remember in 2003, uh -huh, when France and Germany breached the rules of the Stability and Growth Pact, and I think that because of that decision, we lost a lot of legitimacy to impose, uh, you know, fiscal austerity to Greece. So this is something that we cannot repeat again. And I think that it's not only a question of, uh, well, the, the, the governance, the fiscal compact, etc. We need much more uh, compromise and commitment from the different uh, governments with uh, the importance of uh, fiscal discipline and with the importance of a common competitive approach huh, to economic policy uh, among the different members of the Eurozone. But what about uh, in discussing the uh, participation of the ECB? Should the ECB take a haircut the way the private sector would? Well, I, I don't think so. We are discussing about the private sector involvement. I think that, uh, you know, that kind of haircut might impair the uh, monetary mechanism of monetary policy that now is implemented by the ECB. So I think that, uh, I think that the ECB should not be involved in any kind uh, of uh, uh, public sector involvement <laughs> instead of private sector involvement as uh, uh, the private sector uh, you know, is having the discussion with the Greek government right now. And I hope, as, uh, as Oli has mentioned, that uh, you know, we will reach an agreement uh, quite soon. Mr. Minister Baron. I think we have the same position on the euro bond outside the eurozone. They're seen as the kind of philosopher's stone, the ultimate answer to the international crisis, uh, the epicenter of which is the eurozone. What are euro bonds? Well, it means mutualizing debt. But doing that in countries where the main question is sovereign debt, the other main question is how to uh, fuel growth, given that we have to move forward on those two tracks, if we mutualize debt, we don't solve the basic problem, which is the creation of a monetary zone which hasn't been created in an optimal fashion. What we've decided, what we decided in December, is firstly to put our house in order. That means fiscal discipline, that means coordination, that means convergence, and that means solidarity. It is the path of solidarity. And that path is not Eurobone, Eurobonds, it, is, uh, it involves firewalls. Now, down that path, uh, when states have respected their commitments on debt, when the situation is stabler, when confidence uh, is, exists without any doubt in the market, then the time will be right for Eurobonds. But that cannot be a solution uh, to the crisis as it stands at the moment, but rather the ultimate outcome. Thank you. We would like to get the audience involved uh, and, and, and uh, open the uh, session to Q&A. Uh, we have microphones walking around. And, and in the meantime, while we uh, get a microphone to you. I want to play a soundbite from George Soros and uh, Minister Schreble. Uh, let me read this to you. George Soros says that the, um, on the policies out of Germany, the policies Germany is pushing on the Eurozone is creating a deflationary debt spiral, putting pressure on wages and profits and depresses, reduces tax returns, and the debt is expressed in nominal terms. 
a ratio of GDP to debt, GDP declines, and the debt ratio goes against you. This is the trap that we are caught in today. Overcome the short term, and this is the short term, this could lead to a lost decade. How worried are you about a lost decade? I don't agree with uh, George Soros, uh, not surprisingly. And I would like um, to tell him uh, and to tell you, to tell the audience, if you want uh, to create more growth, you can't deliver this only by spending more public money and increasing the deficits. Even in the Anglo-Saxonian uh, economy, we got uh, the report from Roger von Reinhardt that if you have achieved some uh, great, uh, uh, grade of uh, uh, public deficit, increasing deficit is counterproductive in creating growth. Therefore, you need structural reforms. And therefore, we concentrate in Europe not on increasing the deficit, which are even too high, but in structural reforms. And I was, I have been uh, finance minister since a little bit more than two years. At the very beginning, I was asked, how will you deliver your obligations to the European Pact on Stability and Growth on behalf of the German deficit? I said, I, I, my reaction was, we will. The government has decided to do it. Some months later, I was criticized, oh, you are reducing your deficit too, too, too quick, and you destroy growth. Some months later, we delivered in, in Germany growth by 3.7 points in 2010, 3.0 in 2011. And Tim Geithner, our good friend, came over to Berlin and said, oh, we will make American fiscal policy more German-like. Because in, in Germany, I don't know how it, how it works in the United States. In Germany, and I think in Europe it's clear, if you want to have more internal demand, for investment and for consum consumption. You have to deliver some confidence. If you reduce your deficit, if you make your, your deficit sustainable, in Germany it works. People regain confidence and then they spend. The, the actual figures, the actual figures of uh, private consumption in Germany are, are very, high, very sufficient and therefore the German uh, 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 economic outlook is driven by, by the internal demand if, and we can destroy it in increasing the deficit and we can support it and therefore we have to go for structural yeah. reforms and that is a better way and uh, I think it will be. We have, we have two quick comments here from Minister Guindos and then Oli Ren and we have a question then following. No, just uh, a short remark. Uh, I come from the country that put in place the largest fiscal uh, stimulus uh, uh, in the Eurozone from a surplus of 2% in 2007 to a deficit of 11% two years later. And uh, in Spain, simultaneously to this fiscal stimulus, we had the largest deterioration of the labor market that we have ever seen. So I think that we should be careful huh? in, 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 in considering you know, the, 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 the implications that uh, you know, a fiscal expansion has on the economy. Because now in Spain we are having difficulties from the financial standpoint because, uh, well, this fiscal stimulus was, was mistaken. So I think that it's much more important in order to create confidence, as Wolf has mentioned, to put your fiscal accounts on a sustainable path and simultaneously implementing uh, an aggressive and ample agenda of structural reforms. Oli Ren. I would like to bring uh, briefly a global and uh, long-term view on this uh, discussion. In fact, uh, inspired by Jean-Claude Trisset's uh, wise words in one of the yesterday's uh, discussions, uh, if you look at uh, the previous decades and uh, the crisis in previous decades, uh, we have uh, the cases of uh, Latin America in, in the 1980s, uh, since 1982. Then we have uh, the Asian crisis in the 1990s, uh, and we have, in fact, uh, the cases of several European countries in the 1990s. What has been the lesson in uh, all these cases? Uh, they have uh, taken structural reforms uh, and uh, 
reinforced uh, the sustainability of their public finances uh, as the foundation of uh, solid and uh, sustainable economic uh, growth. And as a result, uh, Latin America overall look at Brazil rather resilient uh, even, even in the current uh, global difficulties, uh, financial crisis. Uh, Asia, the same story, much more resilient uh, in the current uh, financial crisis. Uh, and uh, in Europe, uh, if you look at the countries uh, who went through a similar kind of experience, uh, they are now more resilient. Uh, in the 1980s, the Netherlands and uh, Denmark, uh, 30 years ago, sorry to say to my Danish friends, but uh, Denmark was almost the basket case of Europe. Now it is uh, a very resilient and one of the model economies in Europe. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, Finland and Sweden, very serious banking crisis, uh, serious problems of, uh, of uh, external balances, uh, now doing relatively well, and Germany yeah. in the past uh, decade. I think this is an encouraging example of uh, the importance uh, and uh, success of uh, structural reforms uh, in Europe and uh, globally. We have to get two questions in here on the second row, and then I have uh, Minister Baron with a, with a comment. First here in the second row, and then I'm coming in the back. Thank you. It's Luigi Buttiglione from Brevan Howard Assets Management. I want to take advantage of the joint presence of the Spanish Economic Minister and of Commissioner Rehn to ask uh, them a question also leveraging on what they just uh, commented today. Uh, I see the, the Spanish uh, minister said that he basically wants to do all he, he want, all he can to keep his house in order. And I also hear from Commissioner Rehn that he sent five letters in the past to countries which were deviating. Now, unfortunately, uh, you know, we, need, we speak about reassurance and confidence in the market, but we as market participants would like to know, for instance, from the Spanish economic minister uh, what they are going to do to put their house in order this year. As we know, on the last day of last year, there was a, a substantial overshooting of their deficit. Mm -hmm. And now we are hearing some comments which uh, we, are not, we don't find very assuring uh, concerning the, the, the meeting of their targets uh, of 4.4% of GDP this year. I wanted to know, uh, please, if you can reassure us that this, this target will be strict, uh, strictly uh, met. And what is your opinion also, Commissioner Rehn, if this target should be met or or it should not, or because the, yes. the economic condition deteriorated, it should not. Thank Min you. Minister, briefly, please. Well, uh, it's totally, totally right that, uh, you know, well, the new government of Spain uh, arrived, uh, arrived in office uh, on December the 23rd, and on December the 26th learned that uh, we had a slippage in the public accounts of uh, two full per percentage points of GDP, and three days after took action to reduce uh, and to rein in the public deficit uh, by 1.5% of GDP, even increasing, increasing, way, increasing uh, 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 the taxes, the tax, uh, the tax on personal revenues. Simultaneously, today, the Spanish cabinet is taking an action to control and to impose much more transparency on the regions that is uh, generally regarded as one of the main sources of the deviation that you have mentioned before. So the, we will have much more commitment, much more compromise from the regions in terms of, uh, uh, you know, of uh, public consolidation, of public account consolidation, and simultaneously, uh, what I have to say is that the rule that we are going to have for the Spanish regions and for the Spanish central government is going to be even stricter than the rules set in Brussels for the rest of the, for the members of the Eurozone. And finally, with respect to, uh, to uh, uh, you know, your, your comments on the, on the future of the path of fiscal consolidation, what I have to say is that, uh, you know, the, the, the strategy of the Spanish government is going to be based on a two-pillar approach. Fiscal consolidation is not an option. This is something that I have mentioned uh, a lot of times. But simultaneously, we have to pay a lot of attention, and I think that this is going to be vital to the banking industry uh, restructuring and to the labor market uh, reform. Spain is a country with an unemployment rate of 23 percent. Hmm? Uh, of the labor force. This is something that we cannot, uh, we cannot accept at all. Mm. And I think that uh, you know, this is going to be you know, the vital element of stress and uh, of importance and, uh, the, and the main priority that uh, uh, in the agenda of the new government. And I expect that over the next weeks uh, the new government will put forward a reform of the banking industry and simultaneously an ample, profound and important reform of the labour market. How much capital does the, does the banking industry need? 
Well, this is not a question of capital. What uh, we have seen uh, is that uh, you know, there is the need of uh, further provisioning by the Spanish banks because there is a gap between the book value and the market value of the assets, especially the real estate assets. Oli Ren? I think it's, uh, of course, regrettable that uh, the fiscal targets uh, of uh, last year were, were missed. Uh, and uh, therefore, it was very important that uh, the new government, uh, as, uh, as its first act uh, before the end of last year, took uh, action in order to reduce the gap uh, for this year. Yes. And um, I see that uh, the actions uh, the government is uh, planning are essential and uh, necessary, and uh, fiscal consolidation and uh, structural reforms uh, are complementary, of course, uh, not uh, alternatives. Uh, and uh, it's important that uh, Spain will meet its uh, fiscal targets uh, this year in order to achieve uh, its target uh, also next year below 3%. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, it's very important to maintain this uh, strong momentum of uh, structural reforms, uh, both in the banking sector, as uh, Louis referred to, and also in the labor mar market uh, in order to reform its uh, institutions and its uh, functioning, because uh, the unemployment of 23% uh, uh, and youth unemployment of 40-45% uh, is something that uh, no society can for long sustain. Very quickly, Minister Baron, you wanted to uh, address the debt concern as well as growth a moment ago. Please do. Right, just a very brief word uh, on this topic. Sur le débat qui existe entre les in this debate that exists um, between consolidation and growth, we have to reduce de debt. We have to do it uh, according to a specific time scale. In France, we will be um, we will meet our targets. We should be at five seven. We will probably be under five five, and we will work to produce growth. Now, we will be doing that by focusing on the cost of labour. We will be lowering the cost of labour and financing it um, from other sources. That will be the way that France will be supporting uh, growth. Germany. Uh, I'm sure we'll be making its contribution in another way. Each country will do it in their own way. So is, is labor reform the most important point on the agenda right now for France? Quite right. Yeah. And, and for Germany? Minister Chablet? Uh, no, for Germany, I think our uh, most important thing is to uh, uh, look that we have uh, uh, innovations in infrastructure set in place because we have uh, increasing uh, uh, hesitance in public opinion in uh, 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 investments in uh, increasing uh, uh, infrastructure for communication and so on that has to be overcome we have to discuss it on a, uh, we have to uh, fight for new technologies because uh, on behalf on the basic of our democracy we have to know that we uh, have to uh, stick on innovation. Otherwise, we will not uh, be able in future to uh, stick to the relative uh, level of, of wealth and so the stability we have in Germany. Uh, up to now, we are uh, relatively successful, but uh, we must not think that is granted for, for the future. We have to stick on this. And therefore, it's, an, it's a European matter. We, for example, we will work together for uh, something for, for youth employment, for youth training on a European level. It's quite important. We, we can have uh, a win-win situation if we make an, an European market for training young, young, young generations and something else. Minister, it seems like a luxury to be talking about investing in innovation at this very critical time in terms of deficits and austerity put in place. Look, we we have, uh, in reducing our deficit, we have increased uh, our, uh, our budget uh, uh, figures for, uh, for science, for, for research. Uh, you have to concentrate. Uh, if you reducing deficit mean, does not mean you cut every expansion. Uh, you have to look where, where are the investments for future. And uh, therefore, we, we did it and we, we began to do so. And that, that's what we do in all European uh, member states and also European level. And that is in the, the, the real content of the European Summit on Monday. We have a question in the back, please. Yes. 
Thank you very much. My name is Anna Maria Corazza Bildt. I'm a member of the European Parliament for Sweden. Last week, we have voted a very clear position across political groups asking in the negotiation of the new treaty to take into consideration, one, the community approach, two, that everyone should sit around the table, 27 plus the president of the European Parliament, three, that European law is respected, which means that the treaty should work in the frame of the Lisbon Treaty. What are you doing in the final stage of the negotiation to take into account the voice of the 500 million people of Europe that we do represent and not to undermine the common institutions and keep transparency and openness of the decision-making process? Thank you very much. Who would like to address this? Like to, yes, please, Minister. I would like to, uh, first of all, I would like to give you the uh, mobile number of uh, David Cameron. <laughs> <laughs> of course. This uh, is it's not a joke. We would, it would be much more, it's much better, and better to understand for everyone outside of Europe if we would do what we are now to have to do in, 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 our, in, in our fiscal combat in, in the framework of the of European treaties. But that has to be done by, by anonymous decisions. That is the basic of European treaty. Therefore, we go, for the for meantime, we go 17 plus, I hope, plus, plus uh, nine. Uh, everyone is invited to join. And of course, we will make, uh, we are in favor in the treaty to, uh, to make, uh, who, everyone who signs the treaty uh, will take part in the decisions in the treaty. And we will invite the European Parliament to take responsibility. Of course, that is much easier on behalf of the treaties. On the basic, it would be introduced in the treaties. Therefore, on Monday, we agreed in the Eurogroup, we will uh, in, be in favor to implement it in the treaty, not only in five years, but in three years. And that uh, I hope we can convince all our friends in the European Union. Oli, would you like to add to that? Well, in fact, uh, I think Wolfgang, uh, Wolfgang said the essential, but I want to add uh, one aspect. Uh, and I can tell Anne Marie that uh, the Commission, by and large, uh, sees uh, eye to eye with the Parliament uh, as regards uh, the reform of, uh, of uh, the economic governance uh, and uh, this uh, treaty as well. I think it's very important that. Uh, and largely thanks to the European Parliament, uh, the community method uh, is uh, fully restored uh, and in fact uh, even reinforced uh, in the new fiscal compact. Uh, so that uh, once the new fiscal compact uh, will be agreed uh, on Monday, then uh, the Commission in the coming days uh, will supplement uh, the already existing secondary legislation the six pieces of uh, legislation uh, reinforcing economic governance, uh, which we call the six-pack. Uh, and uh, we will make uh, concrete proposals uh, so that uh, while the treaty is a very important uh, political commitment, uh, at the same time its uh, concrete and practical implementation will be done through the secondary legislation, which means uh, precisely through the community method uh, which is the method uh, that makes the European Union to work uh, and uh, to deliver results. We would like to take more questions, but we also want to keep you on time. So I'd like to thank this distinguished panel, and thank you for joining us. Please stay tuned for the next session.